Hello, welcome to the video. I am Sibelian, a software dev slash creative, and today I'm going to talk about how I added vanity skins or in-game cosmetics, whatever you want to call them, uh, how I added those to the game I'm currently working on, which is an auto chess game codenamed Project Caribou. I haven't come up with a real name for it yet. First, let's talk about exactly what I mean by skins. So you might see something like this in games like Apex Legends, League of Legends, Team by Tactics, Overwatch, Fortnite, a lot of multiplayer competitive games use skins to let the user change the way that their character looks, to show off, to give them something to unlock and enjoy, and uh, sometimes it is just an unlockable and other times it is a, an in-game purchase. These systems can get really complicated and really detailed, uh, but I am a solo developer working on an indie game all by myself. So I'm going to talk about a very simple way to do this uh, relative to other ways to do it, but it does require having the ability to change the 3D model, the mesh objects in your game, so that they're built a certain way with regards to the UV coordinates. So unfortunately this won't work if you are using uh, game assets downloaded from like an asset store or if someone else is making these and isn't able to make these changes for you. But I do have a Skillshare course where I talk about my whole process of making 3D models for games. But I do talk a lot about UVs, what they are, how they work, and how to use this specific process to make it so you have game objects where you can change the colors of different parts of the object very easily and in a very performant way. So your game isn't bogged down by loading in a bunch of different textures or changing the shaders a whole bunch. So TLDR, you will need to be able to edit your own 3D models, but other than that, all you really need is Unity. And I'm gonna walk through all the code uh, that I use to make these changes. With that, let's get into it. The first critical part of this process is getting a game object model that has the UVs set up in a certain way. So. UVs are basically coordinates attached to each point on a 3D model that determines which part of an image texture or other texture that point uses. So if we go into UV editing layout in Blender, we can see I have my, my armadillo creature here that I have made. And then on the left, I have the image texture that it is using for getting these colors. So if I select everything here, you can see we've got a couple of lumps of UV coordinates here. So all of these ones here are connected to the main body color, this blue color. And I use gradients to get some variation of the color like that. And then we can see the pink is for these accent colors, the nose, the ears, and then uh, way down here, I have this row, which actually uh, is an emission row. You can't see it in Blender because I don't have the, the shaders set up to support emission right now, but uh, Unity, when I pull this into Unity, this bottom row is set up so that the UVs are given emission values, which means they will glow. The lore that I'm still working on for my game is kind of that these creatures are summoned, they are sort of spirit constructs uh, used to defend, and so they all have this these glowing accents to give that magical quality. Now this method of texturing is affectionately called lazy UV unwrapping. I did not invent this method. Uh, I actually learned it from a couple of other indie developers that use the same process, specifically Rebecca, one of the devs who created Ooplets, and Joyce, who has a Patreon named Minions Art and also does Twitch streaming under that same name, Minions Art. Uh, who is currently working on a game called Astro Cat. I'll link to both of them below because I love them both. I've never met them, I just love them from afar. There is a little bit of a learning curve to using this texturing method because you do have to set up your geometry so that you have these separations between what needs to be a different color. So I do need the edge here to separate the inner ear from the outer ear. I need the, this defined to separate the nose and things like that. So in traditional texturing, you may be able to paint on these details and have a slightly less dense mesh, 
but I feel like the benefits of doing things this way outweigh the slight, slight uh, need for more geometry because this is really what we're getting to here, which is that if I select these UVs and I move them over, we now have a new color on our mesh. And you can do this for any color and it will work. It'll maintain the gradient patterns as long as the gradients are set up to be sort of the same uh, in terms of how quickly they transition. So I've got a number of gradients here and so we're going to get a similar pattern no matter which color we pick. And I only have, you know, this many colors, but you could continue adding more and more all the way to the end here. And of course you can lay out your grid however you like to, to maximize the customization that you want to do. Uh, but this is just a demonstration that we don't need to change anything about the mesh or the material that's applied to the mesh. We can change these UVs and change the entire appearance of the model. And the Unity game engine gives us access to those UVs. We can change them at runtime and it's it's fairly easy. I'm going to go through the math a little bit later when we get there. But one of the big uh, hits on performance for doing things like this is when you have to load a new texture into memory uh, because often the textures are, you know, fairly large, like, you know, 1024, 2048, whatever it is. Especially when you have super high detail models, like you might have in Apex Legends, where the, the textures are necessarily very large, and maybe you have multiple textures just to get all of the detail you need. So with this method, not only can we put just a ton of colors on this for our model, but we can use the same texture for a bunch of different models. So we can reuse the same texture for all the characters in the game and then we only ever have to load one texture into memory and it's it's just a lot better in my opinion and I also find that this method of texturing is much faster than painting uh, which is a concern for me because I am the only person working on this I need to move quickly. And again, if, if the creation of the model is confusing to you, I do have a Skillshare course and there is a link in the description that is a referral link. It's not a sponsorship, it's just a referral where I may get a kickback if you end up signing up for a membership, but it will give you a free trial and that free trial doesn't have to be used on any of my courses. You can use it on any course on Skillshare. So feel free to, to use that if you want to or not use that if you don't want to. But I cover my complete process from start to finish of modeling for Unity using this uh, UV method. So let's actually talk about some important things that we need to be aware of when creating this texture. So I've just created this in GIMP or you could use Photoshop, anything where you can put down blocks of color like this. And the important thing is that you will need to align them in a certain way. So the first important thing is that each separate section of your mesh should be on a different row. And this is because, for example, if I put this up here, um, if I want both of these to be pink, but then I want to move this set somewhere else, I don't have a way to determine like which lump of UVs belongs to a certain part of the mesh. If I have them on separate rows, I can just say anything that is lower than this line and above this line is part of this section. And so I can move that whole thing and it doesn't affect um, like the, the ear color, for example. So the first thing is that you, you should have each group of UVs for a certain like, like the base color, the detail color, the accent color, whatever, however you want to define these should be on its own row. And that's why I have several rows here that all have the same colors, but they are distinct from each other. And the second important thing is that the options, the blocks, columns, should be an even distance apart. So I used GIMP to create a grid and that's what I built all of these color blocks on. I'll put up a recording of how you can access that yourself in GIMP. There should be a very similar process in Photoshop. I just don't use that because it costs money. But by putting these an equal distance apart, I can mathematically determine which of these blocks a current UV is in and move it appropriately into whichever square that it needs to be in when I'm applying the skins in the game. 
And then the last little note that I kind of messed up when I did this, and I say messed up, it's not that big of a deal, but UVs, at least in Unity, start from the bottom left and go up. So I had to do some kind of wonky math because I was counting from the top down. That's how I set this up to make it easy to count. If you want things to be a little bit easier, you may start uh, down here with your different rows and go upward. So before we get into the code for the math on this, uh, we will need to know exactly how many squares we have um, in one row. And I have calculated they are, they're actually 72 pixels wide. This is a 2048 pixel square. There are exactly 28.44 repeating squares. So I've just, I've rounded that to like 28.444. So you can set up your texture grid however you like, but just remember those two rules. Each set should be on its own row and the columns should all be the same size. And now I'm going to talk about how I use code to move those UVs around when we're in Unity, when we're in the game engine. And as a note, all the code here is built on the current version of Unity, which I believe I'm on 2021.2, so I'm a little bit behind, I think. But if you're watching this far in the future, there's a chance that some of this might have changed, so just be aware of that code is updated all the time. So Unity has an API where you can edit mesh data, the UVs are inside that mesh data, I found it most useful to create a static class with static functions to change an object. So I'm not instantiating something to handle these recolors, it's just static. And so I actually have two functions in here. Let's talk about this first one, which is what you call into when you want to change the color of a game object by shifting the UVs. So first I'll mention I do have a variable up here referring to the number of squares in my texture. Like we said, there are 28.444 roughly across and also um, up and down. You don't need to be concerned about any of these. And so here we are at this static method, UV recolor object row. It's kind of, it's not the cleanest name. And I did write a lot of this code a long time ago. So I'm looking at it now and I'm seeing things that could be cleaned up. But basically we just pass in the game object, the index of the row that we want to move the UVs on, and then the index of the column that we want to move the UVs to. So for example, if, if I pass in two, and three, we would change row index two, and we would move it to the third column, or the, I guess the fourth column since it is zero index. And this, this function really addresses getting that mesh off of the game object. So there's actually a couple of different Unity components that could have the mesh data, which is kind of annoying. There's not just one place to grab it from, but I've, I've just put some try-catch blocks here to make sure we get the right one. So basically, when you have a mesh that has skinned animation data, so it's, it's connected to a skeleton or an armature, and it has animations that come from that, you will have a skinned mesh renderer. If it doesn't have that, that skeleton, that armature, it just gets a mesh filter. So here I try to get get component in children for that mesh renderer. If there's an exception, we don't care because we know that sometimes this isn't going to work if it if it has the other type of mesh. And then here, if it's still null, I try to get the mesh filter. Nothing crazy there either. And then regardless of what we get, a mesh filter or mesh renderer, the actual mesh data is in the shared mesh property on whichever component it is. So then once we have our mesh data and it's not null, we can then pass it into this other function I'm going to talk about in a minute, and it will return a mesh that has been updated. Those UVs have been changed. And then we just apply that variable back to that shared mesh to update the actual object in the scene. And some things to note here, if you have multiple meshes in the object you're passing in, this is going to need some finagling because this currently just grabs the first one it finds. It does check the children objects as well. But if you, if you have more complicated meshes, you are going to need to figure out how to get access to the mesh that you want because this code isn't going to do that for you. Okay, now let's get into this other function, which handles the math for making these UV transformations. So the parameters that we pass in here are first, of course, our mesh, uh, which we pass out at the end once it's been changed. The next two are the number of squares horizontally and the number of squares 
vertically. So those are the same here. Next, we have the index of the row that we want to adjust. And then we have the index of the column that we want to put it in. So these are not named super well. And then finally, this one I added later, the maximum index is basically when we wrap around to zero. So here I'm just passing in the maximum number that are available. But in a different scene that I make use of this function in, I actually pass in the number of squares that have color in them because they don't go all the way to the maximum in my texture. I haven't added that many colors. So I use this one to tell it when to start over if I'm just cycling up through all the colors. All right, first we actually create a new mesh by instantiating the mesh we were given. So this is gonna be our recolored mesh. Next, we calculate the size in UV coordinates of each color swatch or each square. So even though the texture goes from like zero to 2048, UV coordinates only go from zero to one. So to get the size of each step, we divide one by the number of steps in the texture. So here it's one divided by 28.444. Um, and I don't know the number that we get here, but you can calculate that out if you want. Uh, and then it is the same for both, but just in case you have some sort of weird texture atlas that is wider than it is tall or vice versa, um, you can always pass in separate values for these. Next, we want to find the coordinates of the row that we're shifting on. And this is where I've done something a little bit wonky. The way that I'm doing it is I'm getting the value and then I'm like flipping it upside down so that the index I'm passing in is counted from the top. Uh, but basically what you need to do to get the lower bound is multiply the row index by the size of each square. So the row index times y step width. You don't need the, the rest of this stuff in yours unless you also want to flip it around like I have done. And then your upper bound is simply going to be the lower bound plus the width of one step. So remember our texture, we want to get the value of the bottom of that row and then the top of that row. Anything between those two values is within the row that we want to slide. Next, we will need an array to put our new UV values in. So each UV is a two-part coordinate, so a vector two. We can get that from the, the mesh object dot UV. Uh, and so we're just gonna grab the length here to make sure we are instantiating an empty array of the same length. And then we are going to iterate through all of those. We are going to first grab the coordinates that we are potentially changing. Next, we check if the Y coordinate of this UV is between the lower and upper bounds. So if it's between here, that means we need to make some changes. If not, we skip right over that, we just copy it right in. So if the coordinate is within the row that we're shifting, we first get the current column index. So the way that we do that is we get the X position from the UV coordinate or, you know, this should technically be dot U, but you know, vector twos use X and Y, even if they're holding a UV value, that's beside the point. So we get the horizontal position. We divide that by the width of each of our squares horizontally. And so this will almost certainly give us like a decimal number, a float of some sort. We wanna cast that to an int, which effectively rounds it down and just drops off the remainder of that value. So we, we can tell exactly which square this is in. So we have our current index. We need to figure out how many indices we need to shift it by to put it in the right position. So we have the desired index. And again, these could be named a little bit more clearly, but this is the index of the column we want to put this UV into. We subtract our current one. This gives us the difference that we need to change it by or the, the number of indices that we need to shift it by. And I have some code here to handle the case where we are shifting above the bounds of the image or above the bounds of our color swatches. So we just add, if the current index plus that value is greater than the maximum, you subtract it by that maximum, it's, it's gonna put, put it back in bounds for us. And then finally, we take that UV X position, we add to it the number of indices we need to shift it by times the width of each block. So this is the number of columns we need to shift it by, 
this is the width of each column. In the end, we're going to add the correct amount of like UV distance to put it into the into the right position. And this does work if you're going the opposite way. So for example, if we want to go to index two, but we're at index five, this is going to be a negative three. It's going to um, make this a negative number and we are going to shift backwards, so to speak. So regardless of whether we are shifting it to the right or to the left of where it currently is, um, this math will work. And then here we are again. So whether we change the value or not, we are finally adding that UV into this array. We go through all of the UVs. And then once we have our new UV array, we first assign that to our recolored mesh by doing dot UV and just assigning it. And then we return that recolored mesh. So we go back up. This is where this method was called. And then like we briefly covered, we just assign that recolored mesh to the shared mesh property. And you will see that that change reflected in the game. So that's really all you do. I know it took a it took a minute to walk through all of this, but the math is not terribly complicated. It really is just understanding loops, understanding the the math here, the positions of everything. Uh, but once you get this code in, you don't ever have to look at it again. You can just use your static method here, pass in the game object, pass in the row, and everything will work uh, pretty easily. Now, if all you want is to change the colors of objects, you're done. You can you can use that code uh, wherever you need to use it. But I want to step further. I wanted to define preset skins where we have a combination of colors that go together and that is one skin and it applies the values to all of those different options. So for example, for armadillo that we looked at, I have the main body, the ear and nose accents, and then I have that emission color. So I'm not going to get too deep into this one because this does tend to be a little bit more specific to the project you're working with. But what I've done is I've, I've created a scriptable object. You could also do this in JSON or any other kind of like serializable data structure that you want to use. I've been using this because I've been playing with scriptable objects. I don't love them because they get kind of tricky with testing, but that's this is not the time or place to talk about that. Uh, but basically all I've done here, I have one of these for each type of character. So I, I define the ID of the character at the top. And then also this is really just informational. I have made variables that hold descriptions of what each row colors. So when I'm creating these, I don't have to keep looking back at the model to double check where I put all these UV values. And then I have a list of options. Each of these options represents one skin. It has an ID just used for looking them up and, and saving what has been selected. It has a, a friendly name, which is the name I use to display to players. I'm not currently using the shader option, uh, but I, I want to work that in soon. Here I have two arrays. I realized later I could pull these out and just put them assigned to the creature. It would be a little bit cleaner, but sometimes when you're working through code, you just have to get a sloppy solution out first and then you clean it up later. And so I haven't quite gotten around to cleaning this one up, but it does work, so it'll stay for now. But basically, I have a list of row indices and a list of row values. So when I load this skin option, I basically look at this. I say row 5 is going to be set to 2. Row 6 is going to be set to 4. Row 27 is going to be set to 0. And this is our main, our main color. This is the default color defined as a skin. I also have this one. So it sets the accents to 1, the main body to 3 and then the emission to three. And so this one I have described as spring baby <laughs> because it's like a green with a pink and it's very, very springtime. So I've just made a couple of these just on the fly kind of to test things out. But the very cool thing is that to get more skins added to the game, I can literally just click this button and create a new one. And I can edit all these values to, to make a new skin. I don't have the texture up, so I can't look at these numbers and set them to something cool, but maybe I'll just type in like five, seven, three. I don't know. I don't know what this is going to be. I'll name it mystery skin and change the ID 
So I'll leave that. We'll get to that later when we demo it and we'll see what it looks like. But that's how easy it is to add new skins. And if you have a game where you're loading data like from a server, you could potentially define these on the server and update them without even changing the game. That's a really cool and handy way to use a serializable data like this. So here I've defined the presets. The last sort of thing is tying all of this together. So basically what you need is a way for a user to select which option that they want. So what I've done is create a very simple customized creature list. Uh, this is in development. It, it's not complete, like there's nothing in here. The details are pretty bare bones, but I can click customize and then I see all of my options. These are loaded from the scriptable objects. Uh, so we can see that my mystery skin is in here. So now when I click each of these, what it does behind the scenes is uses the numbers from that data structure I just showed you and it runs through each one calling that UV recolor function, static function that we, that we went over and it just updates the colors. So we have spring baby, fire engine red, <laughs> which I guess looks kind of demonic a little bit, maybe not as much a fire engine. And then let's see what we got for mystery skin. Oh, that's <laughs> kind of gross, but uh, not terrible, not terrible. It's interesting how we got so much beige. I didn't even think there was that much beige in the texture. So there's our mystery skin. It almost looks a little bit like a garbage skin or like a toxic waste skin because of the grain. But we, we have all of these options. And once a user has selected an option, so let's say I'll select a mystery skin just to demonstrate. Now the ID of this skin is saved to a player data object. And now if I go back to the main menu, I start our match, that data object that has which skin we've selected for each creature has been passed into this game scene. So I can hit ready, summon an armadillo, and we can see uh, we have our little trash babies, uh, our little trash armadillo in there. So that is the whole skin system working. So like literally all we do is pass these numbers around and use that one static function to transform these UV coordinates to, to make the model look different. And one thing you'll notice is that when I do this, if I go back into our preview list, I can click between these and there's no delay. It's very quick. Uh, because we're not doing anything with textures, we're not doing anything with materials, we're not reloading shaders, we're just using what's already there, and we're changing some, changing some numbers around. So I love this system, I feel like it's very elegant, and thanks again to Rebecca and Joyce both for kind of independently, I think, working with UVs, sharing that knowledge, and just making it so easy for other people to get started and learn what they're doing. So that is how I made a skin system for the creatures in my auto chess game. But you don't have to stop there. You can use UVs to customize literally every object in your game if you want to. You can change buildings, weapons, pieces of the landscape, character items, uh, clothing if you have that available for your characters. You can even skip the part where you have the preset skin configurations and you can just let users cycle through all of the different colors. If you're doing some sort of procedural generation, you can throw a random number in there, set each part of the mesh to uh, just a random row in the texture, and you can get a huge amount of options for whatever it is that you're procedurally generating. So I hope this was helpful. This is the first uh, video I've done that is like a proper technical tutorial video. I've done a couple of uh, dev vlogs, a couple of like brief overviews like of my uh, rigging a bird character in Blender, but this is the first YouTube video that's really focused on teaching something. Let me know if you liked it either by leaving a comment or just by liking the video. But thank you so much for watching. I'll be back soon with another video and I hope to see you there. Bye bye!